Joining me right now is the Atlas Organization founder. He's the uh, author of China's Vision of Victory, Jonathan T. Ward. Jonathan, it's great to have you. As always, welcome back to the program. Hi, Maria. Nice to be here. So let's first talk about the meeting last week. Uh, what is your observation of what took place with, uh, really, the CCP attempting to school the U.S. State Department? Well, I think they took the gloves off, really, but it's been a long time in the making. At this point, they've realized sufficient economic and military power that they're very comfortable advancing an explicitly anti-American agenda. And they've also positioned themselves, really, at this point, at the head of an anti-American coalition that involves Russia, Iran, and other states, potentially. You've seen that in how they're purchasing energy now. And, of course, Sergei Lavrov, the top Russian diplomat, is in China now and um, has been talking about the need for Russia and China to stop using Western payment systems and rely on the dollar less. So, um, you know, Beijing at this point is positioning itself in open confrontation with the United States and has been building up the resources to do so for quite some time. So it means that we are going to have to go ahead with a new uh, strategy towards China. This has to be absolutely bipartisan, as it already is. Um, but this is the main event. It's the main challenge of our lifetimes, and it's going to require total focus from the U.S. government. Well, what should that be? What should the policy be? We've all watched in horror what the CCP has done in Hong Kong, and now we are worried about Taiwan. The defense heads of Japan right. and the U.S. have reportedly agreed to cooperate in the event of a military clash between China and Taiwan. What is your reaction to that, and what should the policy be, Jonathan? Well, I think you need to get three things right in U.S. grand strategy. You need to get defense and deterrence right. You need to get economics right. And you need to get diplomacy right. So first of all, being sure that they are sufficiently deterred in the Pacific, that's going to be a major challenge. It really centers around Taiwan and the South China Sea at this point. Um, economic disengagement is going to be essential. We cannot keep funding this place. We have to pull investment out of their strategic industries, emerging technologies, and civil military fusion. And I think our companies need to start looking for the exit if they're in certain industries that are targeted by Beijing. And then diplomacy matters. And I think this is one where the Biden administration is actually doing a, quite a, um, a good job in the opening moves. I mean, the, the meeting with the Quad was important. So bringing India, Japan, um, and Australia together, bringing Europe closer to the China challenge. And uh, some of this will center around the, the issue of Taiwan and Beijing's um, sort of potential appetite tight to, uh, to go in there. But um, we're going to have to bring the democracies together, and we're going to be confronting something even more broad than China at this point. It's going to involve Russia, too. So it's going to be a global diplomacy that's necessary. Wow. Well, Jonathan, let's talk about that, because you say we have to stop funding the place. I mean, over the weekend, we had a lot of news on this. J.P. Morgan has agreed to pay $410 million for a stake in a leading Chinese wealth management business, as the U.S. financial industry seems to be really the, the, the big winners of a trade deal. The CCP has given licenses to a number of financial services companies to own their own wealth management businesses in China, J.P. Morgan being them. So JPM is acquiring this stake in a Chinese uh, asset manager. And then, of course, you've got the other news, uh, which is about Tesla. Uh, China's government first restricting the use of Tesla vehicles by military staff and employees of certain state-owned companies over concerns of national security leaks. But then Tesla comes out, and, and Tesla says uh, that it is not going to be sharing any data uh, from its cars with China or the United States, for that matter. Your take on the corporate developments uh, as it relates to China. Well, I think the corporates and the banks are running in the opposite direction of the breakdown of the U.S.-China relationship. I mean, they're running in the opposite direction of U.S. defense and national security. And it's really going to be time to somehow reconcile that. I mean, they have to look for other markets. We don't want them to be tied in there um, in ways that transfer technology and know-how uh, to our primary adversary. I mean, at this point, it should be lost on nobody that the U.S.-China relationship is not coming back together. So to invest in that as a long-term opportunity does not seem, uh, you know, very wise. And at the same time, you look at something like Tesla, where apparently China's state banks funded the factory. I mean, Elon Musk is going to have a lot of trouble in China. I mean, I think he's making many, many mistakes here. There's a reason they funded his, his factory, and they want his technology, and they're producing their own national champions. I mean, the electric vehicle sector is one that's been, you know, one of the top targets of Chinese industrial policies. So I think um, for Tesla to be over there 
in, in ways that appear very naive um, is going to be a, a huge issue. And, and that's, I think, um, you know, there are other industries and companies doing that as well. I mean, people are buying into the China market as though it's the 90s or the 2000s. They're, they're missing what's actually happening um, in the changing balance in international security and the deterioration of the U.S.-China relationship. So, so, you know, to really take those risks into account means that you'd have a very different long-term view of China. It's not an opportunity. It's going to be very dangerous for our companies. And our banks, in the meantime, I think, will have to be restrained by U.S. government. And the United, you know, the American public is going to have to start understanding um, how, how we're really, at this point, continuing to fund the rise of our chief adversary, the Communist Party of China. So policy is going to have to be a lot yeah, tougher but, I mean, than it's been. Jonathan, Jamie Dimon, the CEO of, of J.P. Morgan, will say, OK, I'm banking the Chinese people. I'm trying to help the Chinese people. I find the CCP may be bad, but I'm helping the people. If it's going to be outlawed, then outlaw it. But if it's not an outlaw, then I'm going to go set up shop and I'm going to buy a 10 percent stake in this Chinese asset manager. What do you want to say to corporate America, Jonathan? Well, I think they have to understand where their money's going. I mean, it depends on which industry you're in. I mean, if you're in anything that's tied to civil military fusion or anything that's tied to China's industrial policies, I mean, that's where the problems are. So if we're going to be building up their industrial capacity, their technological capacity, anything that could be transferred to their surveillance. I mean, we've seen banks get tied into this already. Um, you know, I mean, you look at what's going on in Xinjiang, and you've seen things like Fidelity backing Hikvision, or uh, I think J.P. Morgan's been in there, too. I mean, a lot of companies are going into, uh, excuse me, a lot of banks are going into companies that we know to be involved in, in the worst uh, excesses of the Chinese state. So, wow. You know, Jonathan, it's great to get your insights as always. Yeah, policy will have to be tougher. We will certainly keep spotlighting it. Jonathan Ward, great to see you this morning. Thank you.